The fall of the year 2017 unearthed the release of Any Other Way, the first and only official box set of recordings by Nashville native and Canadian resident soul singer Jackie Shane. The compilation, which earned her a Grammy, included her previous 45s, a live album, and three unreleased singles. Prior to 2017, the only way to access any of Shane's recordings was through bootleg CDs and watching grainy YouTube clips on the internet. By the time her music got reissued, Shane was pushing 80 and hadn't put out music or performed live in almost five decades. According to the Numero Group producer Douglas McGowan, who was the one to convince Shane to reissue her old work, tracking her down was an arduous and taxing endeavor. McGowan told NPR that anybody who had attempted to call Shane would get hung up on on their first try, and if they tried calling her a second time, she would take out a whistle that she always kept handy and blow it loudly into the receiver. It's happened to me when I didn't speak up immediately. Jackie will say hello, and if I don't say, Hi Jackie, it's me Douglas, so that she gets it's me right away, she'll hang up. I got the whistle blown at me once. The release of Any Other Way introduced Jackie to a brand new generation of fans and even won a Grammy for Best Historical Album. But how on earth did McGowan manage to convince Shane to put out a project after almost 50 years of living in the shadows? That's what we'll explore today. The story of Jackie Shane is one of passion, bold self-determination, and ultimate triumph. This is Have You Seen Her. Jackie Shane was born in Nashville, Tennessee on May 15, 1940. She grew up listening to a wealth of music in her childhood home. Her family listened to blues and gospel on the radio, and her grandmother would sing while cleaning the house. Shane sang high soprano and choir before she hit puberty, and when she was 13, she came out as transgender to her mother, who immediately got on board and even allowed Jackie to borrow her dresses, makeup, and jewelry whenever she went to school. This was in the Jim Crow South in the 1950s, when it was hard enough to be a black person in America, let alone a young black trans girl. However, it's clear that the support of her mother was paramount in the buildup of Jackie's confidence, allowing her to thrive creatively at an early age. The artistic performance realm provided another layer of escape from the outside world where fantasy and transgression were embraced. Before the civil rights movement, there were a collection of American performance venues known as the Chitlin Circuit on the Midwest, East Coast, and Southern states of the U.S., which provided spaces and hubs for black entertainers. It wasn't just cosmopolitan laissez-faire New Orleans that made space on its stages to celebrate performers who were gay or transgender or non-binary, and those performers also weren't necessarily always the marquee stars. As Preston Lauterbach recounts in his 2011 book, The Chitlin Circuit in the Road to Rock and Roll, which draws heavily on mid-20th century accounts from regional African-American newspapers, it was common, almost more so than not, for a night's review to include a troupe of what would usually be billed as female impersonators, before or after a comedian, a magician, a shake dancer, and then finally, at the top of the bill, perhaps Fats Domino or Roy Brown. As a teenager, Shane had made a home for herself at local venues in her hometown of Nashville. She had even studied under Little Richard and his support band, The Upsetters. She later joined a traveling carnival that took her to Cornwall in Montreal. In an interview with Rob Bowman in the liner notes to Any Other Way, Shane said of her first arrival in the Big O, I never felt that good before. I felt so free. I just loved it. After witnessing a racially charged hate crime in her hometown, Shane decided to make Toronto her full-time place of residence. One cannot choose where one is born, Shane later said in an interview with CBC, but you can choose your home. I chose Toronto. She started out performing around the nightclub circuit as a backing vocalist for Frank Motley and his Motley crew. As a solo performer, Shane became a mainstay at the Sapphire Tavern in the Financial District of Toronto. Legendary Canadian soul singer Eric Mercury was a regular at the Sapphire and had seen Jackie perform multiple times, claiming it was like going to see Little Richard. 
I would come out of the Holiday Tavern in Toronto sweating, and it wasn't hot in there except for what Jackie was putting down. We had never seen anything up close like that in Toronto. It was like a tornado coming through the place. Shane's take on rhythm and blues combined the swinging energy of rock and roll with her soulful, androgynous drawl, amassing a great deal of followers who were also queer and trans femmes. I really feel that I have made a place for myself with wonderful people. What I have said, what I have done, they say it makes their lives better. During this time, Shane partnered with Motley to record a live album and an array of singles, including a silky smooth cover of the William Bell Stacks hit, Any Other Way, her highest charting single to date, which cracked the top 10 and even peaked at number two on the Canadian Chum charts. Her uncompromising conviction can be found in the spoken word affirmation she preaches on her cover of Barrett Strong's hit, Money, That's What I Want. You know what my slogan is? Baby, do what you want. Just know what you're doing. As long as you don't force your will and your way on anybody else, live your life because ain't nobody sanctified and holy. For somebody who was so radically visible at that point in time, it seemed incredibly strange for Jackie Shane to suddenly disappear in 1971, right when the LGBT plus rights movement was beginning to actually gain political traction. But at the same time, she didn't need to take up the mantle. Just by existing, she was already pushing and shifting the narrative. I have never felt that I had to change or do anything that wasn't natural to me. I will never ever be some kind of wishy-washy creature that pretends or lets others guide me. I guide my life. It is mine. No matter what anyone says, I'm going to be Jackie. That's all I can be. Whenever we hear stories about non-white trans women, they are often scapegoats for overwhelming news about hate crimes, or they are only allowed to be mouthpieces for a political movement. We rarely allow non-white trans women to be full, complex, nuanced human beings with a full spectrum of emotions. Stories like Jackie Shane's often slip through the cracks of time. Despite her re-establishing her legacy in 2017 and even winning a Grammy, there's still many people who aren't aware of who she is. Even some of the most ardent music fans I know have confessed to me that they have never heard of her. Jackie's story is one we all need to be reminded of, in a world where LGBTQ plus folks rarely ever get a chance to breathe. It is a story of individuality and free will. It is the story of a trans woman who got her hard-earned flowers when she was still alive. She lived her life on her own terms, and that is what makes Jackie Shane's legacy truly iconic 